My name is Stacey Lemery. I am the GA for the Conversations and Complex Studies series that's hosted Bay Park. Um, today we are in the Global Collaboratory, but usually we're up in 400 Eggers, and that's where we'll be next week. Um, we do also usually serve pizza, but today, since we, we're in this room, we can't have pizza here. So when we're all done, if anyone's free to join us, we'll go back up to 400 Eggers and have pizza up there, um, probably around like 1, 1.30. Um, our speaker today is Professor Galia Golan, um, who will be presenting on prospects for the Israeli-Palestinian peace. Uh, after September. Um, she is Professor Emerita of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, head of political science department there, um, also the head of the MA program in government, um, director of the program in conflict resolution. Um, she has authored nine books, um, most recently uh, a book entitled Israel and Palestine, Peace Plans and Proposals from Oslo to Disengagement. Um, so without further ado, I am delighted to present Galia Golan. Uh, good morning. Can you um, can you hear me? Is my, I don't know if the microphone is working. Everything's okay. Okay, uh, I can't hear me, but <laughs> I um, I've been here a number of times. I think going way back uh, when I came just uh, uh, as a peace activist, where I did uh, nothing uh, academic in this area whatsoever, but. Um, then I've come back, I think, a number of times to talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. I wish I could say a lot of progress has been made since the last times I've been here. Uh, unfortunately, not only has a lot of progress not been made, but I think we have also gone backwards, uh, unfortunately. What I'd like to do today is, first of all, to start with some very basic um, things, actually a chronology, just to make sure that we're sort of on the same page. I know people that, uh, some people are very seeped in this issue and others um, perhaps not as much. And so I really would like to start with some very basic things, just go through a quick chronology and then discuss the, um, the situation today. Just to remind people, I think maps are very important. I'm not going to do very much more with the PowerPoint today, but I do think maps are important to remember in this case where we started. I mean, we could go back to biblical times, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, there are those who do. Uh, unfortunately, too many perhaps who do. But I would go back to the mandate which was created uh, when the Ottoman Empire was uh, um, dissolved after World War I. And um, very shortly after the mandate was created by the League of Nations the, um, and given to the British, uh, the British then gave this part, let's see, there we go, uh, they gave this part to the Hashemites and it was called Transjordan. And so when we talk about the mandate, this was in 1922, so when we talk about the mandate, which we do ever since then, the, Pal the Palestinian mandate, we generally talk about, we mean this, whoops, let's go back, sorry about that, we mean this area. There are those who, by the way, like to call all of this the mandate, but basically this became Transjordan, an independent country, and the mandate from 1922 until 1948 was this area. <coughs> Uh, and then in 1947, we get Resolution 181. Uh, this is when the British uh, decided that they were going to have to leave Palestine, mainly because of the, uh, the turmoil between Arabs and Jews, and fight, both of whom were fighting the British. Uh, the, um, and, the, and Resolution 181 called for partition of the mandate area. And interestingly enough, and that's the reason that I put this on, is that there are references to 181 now. So uh, it, is, it is worth remembering that divided or would have divided uh, Palestine into 55% for the Jews, that's the blue, blue part, and 45% for the local Palestinian population. Uh, that didn't happen because the uh, war broke out between the Jews and the local Palestinians. And then uh, after the state was declared in May of 1948, the Arabs, surrounding Arab states invaded, basically, I think, to get a certain amount of land from, for themselves. In any case, the reason I think it's important to uh, see this is that um, there are no borders set. There are no borders set. At the end of that war, the war of 1948, 1949, 
the, um, you have ceasefire lines and you had armistice agreements that were signed in bilateral negotiations between Israel and Jordan, Israel and Syria, Israel and Egypt. And um, two things happened with this. One is that in the course of the war itself and the ceasefire lines and then the armistice agreements where there were some territorial changes, basically what happens that's relevant for us is that this area, the West Bank, the West Bank of the Jordan River, was uh, conquered in that war by Jordan and annexed by Jordan at the result of the war. Other areas were conquered by Israel and annexed by Israel. So the result is a little different from that partition plan, actually quite different from the partition plan. Israel got much more territory than had originally been envisaged. The um, Resolution 181 had called for the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine and an Arab state in Palestine, and the Arab state in Palestine was not created. Basically, the local Palestinians and the Arab states had rejected that partition plan. And so the results of the war are what determine the reality which was Israel, a much larger Israel than anticipated, and the West Bank annexed to Jordan. It changed, Jordan changed its name from Trans, Transjordan to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And um, second important point from this, this time is that no border was set. You had the armistice agreements, which said very clearly these are not borders, these, will not, these are not permanent borders, although there had been some land swaps and so forth. Um, and Israel actually did not have, and to a large degree still doesn't have, official borders at that, in that area, that is, eastern border. This, by the way, is Syria. We also don't have an official border with them. Uh, that's much of the background that I think is important. If we fast forward to 1967, and I'm just going to leave these, um, uh, this, this on. Uh, and this, by the way, is a misnomer in the, in the uh, slide, because these are not official borders. They were not recognized as official borders. Since that time, we have a peace agreement with Jordan, we have a peace agreement with Egypt, and so some borders have been recognized. But to the large degree, our eastern border is not. So if we fast forward to 1967 and the war of 1967, as you know, uh, Israel, I should add, did not have any intention of taking the West Bank, but as the war progressed, that is exactly what happened. And so in the course of the, uh, of the 1967 war, Israel conquered the Sinai, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank of Jordan, and also East Jerusalem. Under the partition plan, as you probably know, the, Jerusalem was to have been an international city because it's importance to the three, whole, the three major religions. Uh, but in the course of that 1948 war, Jerusalem was divided, where Jordan um, uh, took half of it, basically, and the Jews who were living there were moved out. And uh, Israel, as a result of battles, took what became West Jerusalem, and the Palestinians who'd been living there were moved into East, East Jerusalem. And that was where we had the division of the city, the wall built the Jordanians built a wall down the, the middle of the city, and we had East Jerusalem as part of uh, Jordan, and we had West Jerusalem as part of Israel. None of this is particularly recognized outside because Jerusalem was supposed to be an international city. So by the time we get to 1967, Jordan is part, uh, the West Bank is part of Jordan, and uh, Jerusalem is divided. In the course of that war, Israel you reunited Jerusalem, took down the wall that was dividing it, and um, it also occupied the West Bank. Okay. Immediately after that war, there was an Israeli government decision to um, basically return the Sinai to Egypt, to return the Golan Heights to Syria, to have some kind of an autonomy plan for the West Bank. There was even some talk about creating some kind of Palestinian state there. Um, and um, Israel annexed East Jerusalem, reuniting it and annexing it. The, um, there was a general sense in Israel at that time 
that the government tended to let us believe that uh, it was waiting for a phone call, that what 1967 war had basically done was to give us some bargaining chips, something, the lands uh, that belonged to these three Arab states that could be returned in exchange for peace. Uh, and so generally speaking, we thought that we were waiting for a phone call, that the government is waiting for a phone call, they're ready to make peace, we return the territories and so forth. The public did not know about any of these decisions, or certainly not about the decision to hold on to as much of the West Bank as possible with some system of autonomy. And for the most part, we believed that no phone call came. However, I think it is known today, not by most Israelis, but it is known that the phone call did come. And I mention it because, first of all, I think it was extremely important that we could have had peace with Jordan because the phone call did come and King Hussein did offer peace with Israel in return for getting back his territories, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And Israel turned it down for two things, two reasons, and they're relevant till to this day, which is why I mention it. Israel said no on East Jerusalem. Israel wanted to hold on to Jerusalem, the United City, and no to giving back all of the West Bank. Israel wanted to hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley. Jordan Rift Valley is that border right there to this day. We had a labor government at the time, that's why I mention it. Also, it was, it was something that was considered important for Israel in terms of security and Jerusalem. In any case, um, shortly thereafter, there was a meeting of the Arab League at Khartoum, and there was a decision there not to negotiate with Israel or to recognize Israel. No, it was famous three no's, no peace, no negotiation, no recognition. And as a result of that, Israel changed its position, again, not necessarily known to everybody, saying that basically Israel would decide what it would return or not return depending upon our own security interests. In other words, any idea of returning all of Sinai or holding on to Gaza, which had been the original decision. Um, everything now was up for grabs, more to, so to speak. The other important thing, two more important things about this period, and that is the uh, government decision by Israel at the end of June, June 25th and 26th, to annex Jerusalem, as I said, but East Jerusalem, uh, and to expand it. And so the borders of Jerusalem, the municipal borders of Jerusalem that we have today are in fact expanded borders. The city was expanded in, 19, in June of 1967 to three times its size, absorbing about 14 villages around Jerusalem and about 70,000 Palestinians, so that the borders that we see today of Jerusalem are expanded municipal borders, greatly expanded from what they once were. The logic being that there was a thought that at some point the West Bank would be returned uh, and we would want these borders for Jerusalem to take up as much as possible of the West Bank because that might be all that we would be left with in the end. The other thing that started after 67 was, of course, the settlement project that is actually putting Jewish settlers into the occupied territories, the Golan, the West Bank, and Sinai at the time uh, to, well, there are many reasons for it, but it was basically to stake a claim to certain areas. This began early with the labor government, but it didn't become a really serious project until 1977 when the right wing came into power in Israel and began a massive settlement policy so that um, th their decision was to put 100,000 Jewish settlers th in the West Bank uh, and, uh, and Gaza. Uh, today we have in the West Bank uh, close to, well, close to 300,000 Jewish settlers. And that all began pretty much after the Six Day War. Again, I'm going to fast forward in the chronology. 1987, we have the, uh, the end of 1987, the first intifada breaks out, which was a um, civilian uprising by the 
Palestinian population under occupation in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And this led to the 1988 decision by the PLO uh, in November 1988 to create and declare a state, Palestinian state, uh, to accept Resolution 181, which nobody had talked about for years, to accept Resolution 181 uh, and to recognize Israel. The, uh, basically what this was was a decision to agree to, to accept the two-state solution. This, I mentioned the Intifada led to this. There were other factors that led to it, a number of factors. But the important thing is that this was the result of a debate that had been taking place within the PLO for many years, about 15 years, uh, as to what the goal should be. And should the goal be all of Palestine, all of mandated Palestine, to create uh, at some point a Palestinian state in all of Palestine? instead of the state of Israel, uh, or to go for what they were later to call a mini-state, to make a compromise uh, and accept Israel's existence and go for a state only in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. West Bank includes, of course, East Jerusalem. It was a very difficult decision. It was a bloody debate within the PLO, but in 1988, for a combination of reasons, they accepted that. Primarily, I think, because of the pressure from within the occupied territories, from the people. And secondly, I think they came to the conclusion after a number of wars that we'd had that the Arab states weren't going to get Palestine back for them. Soviet Union was already losing interest. We had Gorbachev at that point. Uh, it just wasn't going to happen. I assume that this is uh, one of the major things that tipped the scale they could certainly see in the 1982 war when Israel invaded Lebanon in order to uh, hunt the PLO. Uh, the Arab states didn't come to anybody's aid. Soviet Union didn't. I think these are things all had eventually tipped the scale in this internal debate, and the PLO accepted two states' partition. And I mention it because I think this is the most significant decision taken, because until that time... I won't say that Israel was actively seeking peace or willing to compromise, but I would also have to say whatever Israel was or was not doing, there really wasn't much of a compromise available. Uh, possibly with Jordan, yes, but Israel wasn't willing to give up East Jerusalem and the Jordan Rift Valley. With the Palestinians, there was nothing possible. It was all or nothing. When the Palestinians decided, though, upon this decision, uh, which followed, by the way, King Hussein's uh, basically relinquishing his claim to the West Bank and saying its PLO uh, has the major claim. This became a possibility. If we were talking about a state next to the state of Israel, then there was a possibility. And so I think it was an extraordinarily significant decision, the 1988 decision, because, of course, the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict is this conflict between the Palestinians and the Jews over this same piece of land. And if the Jews accepted partition in 48, if the Palestinians were willing to give up their claim to all of Palestine, then there was a possibility for reaching peace. And so out of this decision... Oslo became possible. When there was a change of government in Israel in 1992, the Labour Party came back to power. Yitzhak Rabin saw the opportunity created by this 1988 PLO decision, also saw the opportunities created by the collapse of the Soviet Union, the emergence of the United States as the sole uh, world power, also was concerned about the, the spread of Islamic fundamentalism and the dangers that that held for Israel, possible nuclearization of Iran in the Middle East. There were a number of factors, but I would say that basically the 1988 decision by the PLO made it possible bringing in a labor government into Israel that realized the opportunity or the possibility. This is what brought about Oslo. And I'm not going to talk about Oslo in any detail, just to say that Oslo was an interim agreement 
It was basically an interim agreement to create autonomy in the West Bank uh, and in the Gaza Strip, explicitly excluding Jerusalem, which Israel had annexed officially in 1980. It had unofficially done so already in 67. But, as I say, the Oslo Plan was an interim agreement to create autonomy, which was to last for no more than five years, during which time Israel would gradually withdraw from the occupied territories and uh, discussions would begin on what would be the final status of these territories. Nothing was said about a state, but what was determined is that there would be this gradual period uh, of with gradual withdrawals. They didn't say exactly where they were supposed to be and so forth, until... Um, final status discussions would determine what would be the final status. And that meant final status discussions to talk about borders, security, what would happen to the settlements, the refugee issue, all of the outstanding issues. Of course, as you know, Oslo failed. Uh, there are many reasons for its failure, one of which I would say would be even the, uh, the fact that it was an interim agreement, which sort of led time, created time, uh, on the one hand, theoretically to create trust, but on the other hand, time for the opponents, the, the settlers on one side, the terrorists on the other side, Islamist terrorists, to try to stop the agreement and to prevent any kind of final settlement. The... Um, and in fact, this was, of course, a very bad period. Uh, it was very good in many ways, in the sense that it was a very hopeful period. But at the same time, there was terrorism that was conducted by Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, not the PLO. Uh, and Israel continued building settlements, because there was nothing in the Oslo Accords that said it couldn't build settlements. And so it continued to expropriate land and to build. In any case, I'm not, as I say, I don't want to go into the, any detail about it, but... Oslo failed for a number of reasons, and one good reason was that a lot of the, the more positive aspects of it simply were not implemented. There was no real monitoring uh, to, to see that it would be implemented, and basically uh, it became more and more difficult to uphold. But one thing I do want to mention that did occur in the Oslo Accords uh, that are relevant today is that in, um, in the Oslo Accords, or a series of seven accords, the, um, Israel did withdraw from the cities in the West Bank and completely from Gaza, with the exception of the settlements. And the Pal a Palestinian Authority was elected and given responsibility for the cities. And uh, that was total responsibility, theoretically, both administrative and security affairs. And that was what was called Area B. Then there was something called Area B. That was Area A. There was something called Area B, which were other areas of the West Bank where uh, Israel would have security re responsibility, but the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, would have civic responsibility. And then Area C, which would be totally Israeli responsibility. This was all supposed to be a moving game. Israel would withdraw first from Area A, which it did, and then from Area B, and more B would become A, and then from C would become B, and B would become A, until finally you had their, this withdrawal. Of course, this didn't happen because the Oslo Accords were basically stopped at one point. And so today you have 60 percent of the West Bank is Area C, total Israeli control. Then you've got Area B, and only the only A parts are the cities in the West Bank. If we then um, just add to this, with the collapse of Oslo, we have the failure of the Camp David talks that took place in the summer of 2000, and, uh, and after that, the second Intifada, which was far more serious, far more violent on both sides than the first Intifada. And that's basically where we got. There is another chapter with the dis when Alex Sharon is in power, he decides to disengage entirely from Gaza. In other words, not only to take out uh, the military, but to take down the settlements and just completely leave it. Uh, however, completely leaving Gaza meant also 
according to the disengagement plan, holding on to control of access, air, sea, and land to Gaza, which is how we have the siege that exists till this day. One more factual thing here. After Sharon takes ill and Olmert comes over, comes into power, we have the Annapolis process. This is an attempt to restart negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, which had basically broken down since Oslo. There had been some stops and starts, but this was a major effort to restart negotiations. And negotiations did go on between, uh, between the PLO and the government of Israel for some time, until basically um, Omert, our prime minister, was charged with corruption and resigned. It happens. We just got another Nobel Prize, so we can weigh our corruption against our scientists. In any case, all of this was to, in a sense, to give you some of the facts as things have been going along in the Arab-Israeli conflict. What I haven't mentioned is public opinion in all of this. And I think it's extremely important because this is probably, probably the most important thing. Public opinion had changed enormously over the years. Whereas in the late 1980s, some 2% of Israelis said that they were willing to see the creation of a Palestinian state, a two-state solution. By the early 90s, and consistent to this very day, 60 to 70 percent of Israelis believe that the, the solution is the creation of a Palestinian state next to Israel, the two-state solution. I think that's an extremely important factor, extremely important percentage. By the way, it's the same percentage on the Palestinian side, equally consistent, equally consistent over the years. Two-state solution in these high percentages. However, as a result of the failure of Oslo, where hopes had been very high, the failure of the Camp David talks, and most importantly, I think, for the Israeli public, the violence of the Second Intifada, which is unlike any of the violence we had experienced in the earlier years, and we experienced plenty. As a result of those things, the Israeli public opinion, while it's steadfast in saying two-state solution, also overwhelming majority saying there's no partner. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. Peace is impossible. There's no partner on the other side. And you have the mirror image on the Palestinian side of support for the two-state solution, but no partner. Israel's building settlements, has no intention of leaving the West Bank. That's from the Palestinian point of view. No partner. And I think it's these disillusionment and disappointment with Oslo, Camp David, that whole process, that led to ultimately the election of a very right-wing government in Israel, the one we have today. It's also, I think, what led to the rise and the election of Hamas in the occupied territories. The, uh, there are other factors in both cases, obviously, but nonetheless, I think this is basically what's behind this turn in each country, in each society, to the more extreme. Out of this sense that the other way didn't work. It didn't work. Negotiations didn't work. And that's, I think, very, very important to bear in mind, because I think that's exactly where the populations are, almost mirror image. And it comes over again and again. It comes out in the opinion polls. In terms of the, quote, peace process itself, as you know, the major issues are the borders, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees. And I include security in the border issue. These are the key issues. This is what, theoretically, we've been discussing over and over again. And I mentioned that after Annapolis, the, there were talks uh, between Olmert and Abu Mazen. And if we take this border issue, and by the way, I believe that the border issue is the key. And I've been told by the negotiators on both sides that this is the key. 
and it's turned out to be the most difficult issue, borders. And the problems that have arisen in one government after another of Israel have been this issue of the Jordan Rift Valley, wanting to hold on to that eastern border, in quotes, which would be the border between Palestine and Jordan. Not, we're not talking about the border between Israel and the West Bank, or Israel and the Palestinian state. The, the argument here has been, um, under Olmert, apparently there was some willingness to, to budge on this, to move on this border issue. Under Netanyahu, uh, he talks about, he's returned to an old phrase that we used to use, and that was defensible borders. Uh, and the concept that used to be around uh, in security matters of strategic depth. It used to be said that we needed, for those who weren't talking about holding on to the occupied territories for religious reasons or historic reasons, there were those who said we should hold on to it for security reasons. We needed strategic depth, something between us and the Arab world. Sinai, until we had a peace agreement with Egypt, the West Bank. But um, in time, by the way, that particular concept disappeared from at least most, most conversation. And I think one of the reasons is that Israeli, Israeli military doctrine changed after the first Gulf War, where we were hit with 39 Scud missiles. Uh, things changed, and the realization became that uh, the next wars were going to be rockets. Our danger was from rockets, missiles. And this concept of strategic depth became much, much, much less significant. This little piece of land was not going to make much of a difference when you're talking about medium-range missiles, short-range missiles for that matter. Demilitarizations, yes. Many, almost every leader has talked about demilitarizations. But the question is, as I say, on the one hand, um, holding on to that eastern area, there are signs that Olmert was willing to agree to something like perhaps an international force for that border, just to make sure that no, say, the Iraqi army would come through Jordan and sit there. That's basically the concern. That is some kind of international force. Abu Mazen did agree to the idea of an international force. Okay, you don't trust Palestinians to hold on to that, protect that border, keep, say, the Iraqi army out or something of that nature. An international force. We don't know for sure, uh, but this seems to be what they were working on. Under Netanyahu, that's gone. It's back to we have to hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley. But the real issue, aside from that, under Netanyahu has become the issue of the other border, which was always a difficult issue, the border between Israel and the Palestinian state. And the reason that's a problem is the settlements. That has been basically the sticking point. Is how do you draw that border? Of course, the Palestinian position has been the mini-state is, okay, we decided in 1988 to give up 78% of historic or, or mandated Palestine and to make do with the state in 22%, the West Bank and Gaza. In other words, as I said, the 4 June 1967 border. But Israel, when it began negotiations, even in the Oslo period, was talking about, well, maybe not exactly the 67 border. And the major reason is the settlements. How do, you how do you accommodate the settlers? And the settler numbers have been growing ever since then. They've doubled since Oslo. And so the real issue on the border has become, what, where do you put this border? It can't be on the four June 67 lines. That's Israel's position. Why? Why the only reason? The settlements. And so now there's an issue, and it began a while back, of maybe talking about settlement blocks, bringing in settlers from the outlying areas into certain blocks close to the 67 border. And the idea has been brought up that in exchange for then taking part 
of the West Bank and keeping it for the settlers, uh, there'll be a land swap. And certain areas within Israel that are empty, not populated, could then be transferred to the Palestinian state. And so you have had this concept of swaps come. It was raised in Camp David. Uh, and apparently, the negotiations under Abu Mazen and Olmert got very close on this, where according to what we've been able to get from Olmert and from Abu Mazen, interviews and also WikiLeaks, we find that apparently they reached a point where Israel was going to hold on to, or wanted to hold on to 6.5% of the West Bank. Gaza was already a foregone conclusion. Israel, no claim to Gaza anymore. 6.5% of the West Bank. Abu Mazen said no more than 1.9%. And theoretically, a lot of this, almost all of it, was to be taken care of in equal swaps. We take one square kilometer, you get one square kilometer, that kind of thing. Uh, and according to Abu Mazen, negotiations were to take place to try to narrow this gap. But uh, Israel attacked Gaza, the Gaza war, and then Olmert was brought up on charges, said he was resigning, and those negotiations that were to have continued never took place. Jerusalem. Again, we're putting together bits and pieces. Nothing has ever been said that we know for sure, clearly, factually. Abu Mazen has said certain things about what was decided in talks regarding Jerusalem. Omar has said certain things. And the Al Jazeera revelations that were papers, uh, material leaked from the Palestinian negotiating office indicate that there was apparently a good deal of agreement between Olmert and Abu Mazen on Jerusalem, whereby the holy basin, that is the holy places and an area around them, would be conducted, would be neither under Israeli nor under Palestinian sovereignty, but under international control with Palestine, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, United States, maybe Egypt. None of this is entirely clear. Uh, and um, they would use what was called the, the Clinton formula, something President Clinton had proposed, talking about East Jerusalem, where there have been many Israeli neighborhoods, settlements built. The formula was that what was Arab would be under Palestinian sovereignty, what was Jewish would be under Israeli sovereignty. And what this meant was something like 13 areas, what we call neighborhoods, Palestinians see as settlements. These are Jewish neighborhoods that were built in East Jerusalem after 67, so for all intents and purposes, they are settlements. Of those, apparently, according to Al Jazeera, Abu Mazen agreed that, it, that what was Jewish, where these were Jews, it would be Israeli sovereignty, with the exception of one, Ha Homa, for which Abu Mazen, who's denied this, uh, has taken, I think, a good deal of static from his own people for having given too much or agreed to too much on Jerusalem. This is all talk because, of course, nothing was finalized. And on the refugees, we don't really know what was decided on the refugee issue. Uh, mainly, it is clear and has been made clear by every Israeli government and apparently also Omer that um, Israel is not going to take back millions of refugees and not even close to that. Uh, according to some accounts, there was, uh, there was some understanding on the refugee issue, but basically that the refugees would be resettled in other places, and Israel would take in only a very, very, very small number. Now, Bibi and all of this is basically entirely different. Uh, none of this is relevant in terms of uh, Netanyahu. The, um, he, has, he has basically added some conditions uh, to uh, the way in which he sees a final agreement. He did, he did say he accepts the idea of two states, demilitarized state on the West Bank, uh, but he's made it very firm that it will be, we have to hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley. Jerusalem, forget it, Jerusalem is united, will remain united, there will be no change in the status of Jerusalem. Uh, and. Um, 
The rest, of course, is for basically for negotiation. But um, he also added this a new condition, and he said that, that the Palestinians must recognize Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Uh, I want to make one comment on that so that it is uh, understood. And that is that Israel's historic and traditional problem in the region has been the sense of insecurity, of not being accepted, of course, of being viewed as a foreign element, uh, and um, for that reason constantly under threat. In the Oslo Accords, the Palestinians, the PLO, accepted Israel's right to exist. We can go back to 1988, the acceptance of Resolution 181, partition, build a state next to the state of Israel. But for Israel, that wasn't enough. It didn't want our existence simply recognized. We wanted our right to exist recognized. And we got that in Oslo. Netanyahu added, now he wants it recognized as a Jewish state, uh, which is a very problematic condition because we also have 20% of the citizens of Israel who are Palestinians. These are, these are Palestinian Arabs who remained under uh, Israeli uh, administration when the state was created. And so this is very problematic for the pa Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, because you've got a very, very large Palestinian minority. In any case, uh, and we have these other, these other uh, attributes of an agreement or of a, of a position uh, that we've heard from, from Netanyahu. Finally, with regard to the Palestinian move, since Netanyahu has come to power, basically I believe that they've had a, a three-pronged strategy. And they say that, so it's not something we have to guess at. One of it is very clearly nonviolence. The uh, Abu Mazen was not a supporter of the violence of the, in the second uh, intifada. And he is a, very firm in his um, belief in nonviolence. But for very pragmatic reasons, if not for other reasons, it certainly didn't do them any good, the violence of the second intifada. The second part of their strategy is um, building an infrastructure. The Prime Minister, uh, Fayyad, uh, Salim, Fayyad, um, Salim Fayyad, had a plan to build the infrastructure of the state, much the way the Jews and the Zionist movement had done pre-state Israel, to build the institutions, economic institutions, security institutions, and so forth. And the idea was to do this up uh, by the time we got to August 2011, which was done. It was indeed achieved. And the third part of this strategy was to go to the international community. Out of a sense that bilateral talks had gotten nowhere. They had reached the point where they were clearly not doing anything. And actually were becoming an embarrassment. Because all the time you had negotiations going on, Israel's continuing to build settlements, expropriating land. The Palestinian public was very... Uh, I would say angry even, and the Israeli public basically ignored all these talks that were going on under, under Olmert, for example, because nothing seemed to be leading to anything. What the results that I've said to you were not known. Most people did not take those talks seriously. And the sense, the frustration has been such that the Palestinians, in any case, decided to go to the international community, which is what's behind this move to the United Nations to get UN recognition of the state that was created in 1988, which would then give the Palestinians, I think, a few things. One would be uh, an official position in various international organizations. I read in today's paper that they're applying for official position membership in UNESCO and that the United States has said it will stop pay its payments to UNESCO if they accept the PLO, the Palestinian state. Um, which I think is a little extreme, but uh, that would be one thing that they could get. They could go as a state to the ICC or to the International Court in The Hague as a state. Secondly, it would improve their position in terms of this asymmetry between Israel and 
the Palestinians, to give them at least a boost by having uh, this international backing. And the third thing is that it would isolate or serve to isolate Israel further politically. And I think these were the three objectives in going to the United Nations and seeking membership and recognition. And finally, just one last word about um, Israel today with all of this. We have today, as I said, the most right-wing government we've ever had. It's a very strong coalition, very, very strong. It is not going to fall they will, until they decide themselves that they're going to have elections earlier than when they're scheduled in another year and a half. Um, and the public, I think the public is pretty much indifferent to this issue, the conflict. The public had sort of moved into a, the degree of apathy that said, there's no solution to this thing, there's no partner, we tried. Doesn't mean they're necessarily happy. I mentioned earlier the, the, the survey results. Supporting it, yes, two-state solution, uh, but a general disbelief. And then the public awakened over the summer in our Israel summer, the social justice movement or, or protest which explicitly excluded any reference to the conflict so as not to alienate various parts of the society. So if I were to look at the Israeli domestic scene, I would say there's really very little hope and that most people have very little hope of anything being resolved in the conflict with the Palestinians. But there are two things I think are worth mentioning. One is a poll that was done recently. There are two uh, academics, Palestinian Khalil Shikaki and an Israeli Yaakov Shamir, who do surveys, polls every uh, four months usually. Khalil Shikaki in the, in the West Bank and Gaza, and Shamir, it's uh, Yaakov Shamir in Israel. And last week, as the um, PLO was going to the United Nations, they published a survey of the, from Israel which indicated that 69% of Israelis said that if the United Nations accepted the Palestinians, the Palestinian state as a member, that is, they recognize the Palestinian state, even as a non-member state, Israel should accept that decision, which I think is absolutely amazing. Very few Israelis, I think, even know about this. I mentioned it in a, in a speech, in a demonstration, but I'm sure people don't know about it, which is amazing, which did suggest that the population is a little bit smarter than the government. And I'm, by the way, I don't mean that cynically, because even if you take a very, very narrow view, Israeli interests... Going to the United Nations with the PLO or accepting this kind of decision at the, at, the, at the United Nations would have given implicitly, if not explicitly, first of all, Israel's presence in, the West, in, in West Jerusalem. Nothing on Jerusalem has ever been accepted officially. Every time Israel, when Israel created the capital in West Jerusalem, when it annexed West Jerusalem, and then later when it annexed East Jerusalem, it was always condemned by the United Nations. Now, the PLO goes to the United Nations and wants recognition of the Palestinian state in the 1967 borders with its capital in East Jerusalem. By implication, we might have gotten some recognition of our position in West Jerusalem. Secondly, Palestinian state in the 1967 borders. We never had a recognized eastern border. So if you take a very narrow interest, Israeli interest, I did say in a speech it was idiotic. I won't go so far, but it would have been wise to take a different position. And interestingly, 69% of Israelis seem to think that it would have been a lot smarter and a lot less problematic for Israel in the world if we had just said, okay, what is it really going to change on the ground? What is it really going to do? 
The other encouraging thing I see, besides that 69%, is that very important key elements in the Israeli establishment, and I mean here the security elements, Mossad, Shin Bet, the army, believe that we must reach an agreement, that the present situation is not only untenable but bad for Israel, and that it's going to get worse, amongst other reasons, because of the Arab Spring, that we should and must move ahead. And that I find encouraging because, whether we like it or not, these are the elements in the Israeli establishment that are the most important, for better or for worse. And so I do find that encouraging. And I think probably I'll stop here. If there is anything encouraging, it would be, I think, these last two things I mentioned. Um, I wouldn't get too excited about them, but I like to be a little optimistic uh, and... And so I mention them. That's about it. I don't know if we have time for questions. I always take longer than I intended. Can I yeah, Kath. Mm-hmm. Um, we had some uh, Palestinian scholars here last year who were talking about a movement towards a one state solution. Um, whereby there would be one Israel, but the status of the uh, Palestinians would be as uh, full citizens. And I'm just wondering. If I wonder if I should take a couple questions. Sure. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, what are the fundamental reasons uh, which brought a uh, kind of paradigm shift in the thinking pattern of people on both sides? They initially not having to believe for two state solution and then. 69% of people on both sides of the border, now they have agreed to it that we, the two-state solution is the only solution. What are some of the contributory factors to this? Ah, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, is there another one? Yes, sir. Um, what's your comment, the last comment you mentioned about the effect of the Arab Spring on, on the conflict? And where do you see specifically the relationship with Egypt in light of what's been happening in the past few years? Yeah. Okay, then we'll go um, one, two, three. The one state solution, which I think is a misnomer because it's not a solution. Uh, and Israel will never agree to one state. One state, the idea goes all the way back, of course, and that is you have basically a binational state in Israel, which uh, it, all Israeli governments and the population uh, reject because ultimately, if you had that situation, uh, the Palestinians would become a majority, a majority demographically, and the idea of a state for the Jewish people, uh, Israel, would be gone. Uh, and so it, it really is truly a non-starter. It won't happen. There is no Israeli government that I can even dream of that would accept it. I can think of confederation at some point if there's a Palestinian state next to the state of Israel. Maybe uh, Abi Iban used to talk about Israel, Palestine, and Jordan as a confederation. These things may actually happen. I, I, I think it would be a very good idea. But, um, but, but you raise it. Because what has happened is a lot of people, by the way, even some in Israel, but very, very few, but certainly amongst the Palestinians in the occupied territories and Palestinian citizens of Israel, you do have more and more people saying this two-state idea didn't work. It's not going to happen. And have gone back to the idea of all of it. Not that necessarily all of it has to be called Palestine, but the idea of the binational state. The, um, what is true, and I think, by the way, this was a major factor in Sharon's decision to disengage from Gaza, is that the old Labour Party position has been increasingly acknowledged or recognized by a lot of people in Israel, including on the right wing, of the, quote, demographic issue. That between the Mediterranean Sea and the eastern border, that is Jordan over here, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, within a not too many years, Jews will be a minority vis-a-vis the Palestinians. And then you have an apartheid situation 
where you have this Jewish minority ruling over a Palestinian majority and denying the vast majority of that Palestinian majority rights. It is, in a sense, the situation we have today where we rule the West Bank, but it's still occupied territory. So theoretically, it's not ours. We never annexed it. But ultimately, this would be apartheid, which is why Carter's book is called Peace or Apartheid. The, um, but anyway, I, I hear increasingly, I must say, from Palestinians the idea of this two-state solution thing didn't work. Let's go back to the one-state idea or binational state. Um, but as I said, it's not a solution. It will only, the truth is it will just be a formula for bloodshed because Israel will never accept it. Um, question number two. Why this majority on both sides? I think in Israel, and I want to try to be brief, I think in Israel we can see, you can actually see in the studies that have been done by Yaakov and Michal Shamir, tracing public opinion in Israel from 1967 all the way up, you can actually see the growth and even a jump in the direction of what I would call dovishness, of greater willingness to compromise. And that jump came in the first intifada, and I think a couple things were operative. One is I think that people began to realize that you can't hold on to the status quo, that things are moving, there's a dynamic here, and put it in different words, the Palestinians aren't going to sit there and accept occupation indefinitely. And so that the territories maybe aren't providing, enhancing our security, but actually are harming our security. The other thing I think is globalization. Israel in the 1980s, joined the world, globalized. We threw out the welfare state. That's what the social protest was over this summer. We threw out the welfare state. We became a capitalist country. And people began to just be out for themselves. They just want to make a living. And you could hear this in interviews and so forth in the late 1980s, the early 90s, just let us get on with our lives. Who needs this? Who needs this conflict? And so you could see in the polls this greater willingness to compromise. It was a very, very interesting phenomenon. It's not what Rabin, I mentioned Rabin had other think, things on thinking about nuclearization in Iran and in the Middle East, uh, worries over the Islamic uh, spread of Islamism, fundamentalism. He had other things that were, that were uh, moving him towards compromise. And really wanting to reach, at the end of the conflict, to get Israel out of this whole Middle Eastern formula of, uh, or of, of, of rising fundamentalism and so forth. To get us, take us away from being a target for this. Um, the Palestinian side, I think it came from the frustration within the occupied territories. And that was a lot of pressure on the PLO outside. In addition to which, as I mentioned, they lost the Soviet Union and they lost the Soviet backing. Because the PLO supported uh, Saddam Hussein, they also lost Saudi backing, and the Saudis were their financial um, uh, backers. So the PLO was in trouble, lost their financial backers, lost their political backers, the Soviet Union had pressure from below. And as I said, I think this was a, this was a, I know this was a debate going on for years. And I think the Lebanon war had affected it, where people, some people on the Palestinian side came out of the Lebanon war saying Israel only understands force, and so we have to hit it with, use military means. But another segment said, there's no use. We're not going to destroy them. The Arab states aren't going to help us destroy them. The Soviets are gone. And that element won. There were a couple of people like, like uh, Hamami and, and uh, Saltawi who were assassinated in this internal struggle, the PLO. But Arafat supported the two-state solution. These guys won. Um, what was the third? Qu oh, the, the Arab Spring. Well, the Arab Spring, it's funny. The, the Israeli public loved the Arab Spring. Uh, my uh, colleagues, at the, um, friends at television have explained that um, they can always see what's, by ratings, what's being watched. The Israeli public was glued to the television, particularly when it started, the um, uprising began in Egypt. The 
public loved what was going on. I mean, it was just exciting. It was, it was truly exciting. The government was not uh, terribly happy. <laughs> And, and they were right to a certain degree in the sense that, yes, it is true. In most of these countries, and certainly in Egypt, one of the only, if not the only, organized element of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they're not exactly friendly towards Israel. In addition to which, we also knew that the public in Egypt and the public in Jordan were not behind the peace agreements. So long as there wasn't resolution of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, the publics were not happy. The intellectuals were not happy. And so if you're going to have real democracy in Egypt and maybe in Jordan, if they really, the leaders who ultimately emerge, really listen to the public, they're not going to be happy with Israel. And we do see that, even without the Muslim Brotherhood actually coming to power. Uh, we can see it. This is, by the way, what I believe Yitzhak Rabin understood all along, is that without resolving the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, we could only expect trouble, whether it was going to be from Gaza, even if we're not present in Gaza, or if it was going to be in a democratic Middle East, or Iran. Because this is the, the mobilizing factor, and this is the thing that there's no, there's no getting around. Each for their own reasons, and it's very complicated, of course, the attitude in the Arab world towards the Palestinians. But uh, there, is, there is a reason to be concerned. And the pipeline we have, the gas deal we have with Egypt, is in danger. It's been sabotaged, and now the agreement, there's a call to change the agreement. There are problems. And they should be expected. And another interesting thing is a number of right-wing people, or I would say maybe middle-of-the-road people, people you know, um, actually wrote some articles saying, and our security forces, this is one of the reasons for their saying it too, we must make an agreement. We must resolve the issue with the Palestinians because they understood what was happening in the, in the Middle East. And it was positive in that sense that it got people, the right people, thinking that, yes, there are these dangers in the Arab Spring, and the way to address those dangers is not the way that Netanyahu has decided to do it, but rather see that as all the more reason for reaching an agreement with the Palestinians and ending the conflict. Yes. Do you see do you see Ehud Barak on the same track as Yitzhak Rabin? Um, I've heard that some people think that's where, what he's going to do. Rabin was was prime minister for a while, then defense minister, then became prime minister again. And Ehud Barak, same thing, a prime now, minister. Now he's defense minister, and maybe he'll Barak, be prime minister. Again. I, I think he's finished in Israeli politics. Uh, he. The interesting thing is he has been saying consistently, ever since he's been in the Netanyahu's government, we must make an agreement, this is the wrong policy, we've got to do this, this, and this, but he never does anything about it. He doesn't stand on it, he doesn't insist on it, and he just keeps getting closer and closer to Netanyahu. So uh, I have very little hope from him. And then when he decided finally to leave Labour and create this other party in, and, and, and uh, stay in the, in, the, in the government, I think he destroyed any chances for anything. The, 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 he, uh, if he stands, there isn't a single poll that would give him even one seat in the Knesset in the next elections. And, and I think that everybody would be very happy to see him just to go back to his luxury apartment and stay there. <laughs> he was a tremendous disappointment to the peace movement, Tremendous disappointment to the peace movement. And he built settlements like crazy. Um, and he can talk a good game, but he does not stand for any of it. Won't stand up for it. Yes. You, Ronit, you can't ask a question. <laughs> Sorry. Studenti, lo studenti, the colleague Shelley, my uh, colleague who's Absolutely cannot ask a question. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. 
I've heard in various, both the um, English language and Hebrew language, that the reason that um, Netanyahu doesn't join with Livni and Kadima and form a new coalition that would be a peacemaking coalition is because he has uh, the American Congress in his back pocket. And so he doesn't have the pressure from the the, the great American patriot. Now, I, I, I think there's something to that because Shamir, way back when the whole Oslo started with Madrid, was in a sense pressured, dragged, you know, basically dragged there uh, by um, Bush Sr. and in sort of a very different American presidency. And I'm wondering how much you make of this. So, so, so you know, can Israel do this on its own without the sort of the tough love that Clinton proposed and that sort of moved the process forward and that I don't see coming from the, the US Congress today or really from Obama, whose mind is on other issues, whether it's the economy or the elections. I would separate your question. The idea of uh, not joining a peace coalition with Sipi Libni is a different issue altogether because I don't think Netanyahu is a peacemaker. I think he firmly believes that we will never be accepted in the Middle East, that peace is impossible. I think it's ideological. Okay? So I put that aside. However, I did believe that he would be open to American pressure. Only American pressure, obviously. The Europeans don't count. But, and I really believed it. And actually, I said it in a lot of places. Um, and, I, and, I, and my hopes were very, very high with Obama because Israel has buckled under to American pressure in the past. Not every time, but pretty consistently. Kissinger's pressure, you just mentioned Bush, senior on Shamir. And there have been other occasions, by the way. Very interesting. But, and I thought it would happen. I think Obama picked the wrong issue. As much as I oppose the settlements, he put all his big guns on the settlement issue, which was the wrong way to go. Netanyahu stood, stood firm. I mean, he gave a little, but he basically stood firm. Saw that he could defeat Obama, that he could stand up to him. And that, so the show is over. Now, I, I think Obama could have, could have and could still exert pressure it might work. As I say, in the past, I believed it would work because the, Amer the Israeli public is very sensitive on the American issue. It's the only ally we've got. Um, I'm not saying it's negligent, but it, it's still not much. Um, and I think, I think that I think it can work. But as you said, it doesn't look like Obama's going to do it. And, and what happened in the United Nations, I think, was just scandalous. I mean, it was just sad. Um, and so Netanyahu, I don't think he, I think he feels that he can continue to stand up to, I mean, look what happened. We did, the, the Americans did what they did in the United Nations. In my opinion, Obama, he humiliated himself, um, I think. And then a few days later, we're building in East Jerusalem. I mean, so there's clearly that, you know, we can stand up to this. But again, the people who are worried uh, are, are people who realize that we, we can't go on doing this, and we can't ignore Europe, and we can't ignore the whole world. And occasionally you even hear a businessman or two saying that, uh, you know, if they just stop, if they decide to to refrain from unloading our goods in Europe one day, <laughs> we could have trouble. Yeah, so um, so I, I believe that American pressure can make a difference. I don't believe it's going to come, apparently. Some people still believe a second term Obama will be different. I, I don't know. It's up to you people. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but it is also true. I, I'll be very frank. I don't think we have anything to hope for from the so long as Netanyahu is in, in this coalition. I mean, I really don't. I, I feel that we have to wait out this coalition. We have to try to change the, the balance of power between the right wing and the left wing or the center in Israel. 
And all we can hope, that's all we can hope for. I don't see anything happening with, I'd love to be wrong. And it's an, it can happen. And I, I really would love to be wrong. Is the 69% old for Gaza as well? Does the, does the 69% hold for Gaza as well as for the West Bank? Meaning, uh, do, in favor of, of the Palestinian side, right. the 60 to 70 percent. Um, yes. Oddly enough, yes. Because the, the Gazans are not pro-Hamas. As a matter of fact, they're probably becoming a little less pro-Hamas than the West Bank because they're living under Hamas. Um, they, um, there haven't been enormous changes, but the Hamas is not as strong as it was, uh, f say, two years ago. Um, so when you ask in a poll, in a survey, yes, you still get your two-state solution, but you get the same, it's impossible, no partner. I mean, it's basically, I think, pretty much, pretty much the same. There are those who say that Hamas has changed somewhat, that, uh, that they're more willing to go along and so on. Um, I'm not an expert on Hamas. I know Hamas still has a position of not recognizing Israel. And so I don't put much hope in them. On the other hand, I don't think we can ignore them. And I think that a, the reconciliation... Well, it hasn't really happened, but the agreement to reconcile between Hamas and Fatah was, I think, important because they have to, they have to, they have to at some point work together. And I think it was a serious mistake of the United States and Europe when there was the Mecca agreement, when there was a, a uni, national unity government, Fatah went into the Hamas government and they worked out a deal. And Israel, the United States, Europe all said, no, if Hamas is there, we won't deal with it. Um, but that agreement had said, and I think Hamas still holds to this, that if um, that Abu Mazen could go on negotiating with Israel, and if they came up with an agreement, there would be a referendum. Well, I... And, and now I'll go back to those polls and Khalil Shikaki and Yaakov Shamir, a very interesting thing, which does give one hope. And that is that when you poll Israelis or Palestinians and you ask specific questions like refugees, no way, no compromise whatsoever on the refugee issue. That's what your Palestinian answer will be. Talk about Jerusalem. Israeli, no way any compromise on division of Jerusalem. Borders, whatever. You, when you do your specific questions, you get n no compromise possible. Both the Palestinian results, the Israeli results. But these two gentlemen, when they asked, they gave the whole package, the whole package, and we all know what the whole package is going to look like, supported both sides. And I, firm, and I take a great deal of hope. I brought, I brought Khalil to Shikaki to come to speak to my students and to talk about this, to show the, this poll, the statistics and the poll results, because these guys are good. These are not pollsters. These are academics. Both of them are sociologists. In any case, what I get from this is that if the Israeli public believes that the conflict is going to be end of conflict, that's the magic phrase, end of conflict, it will support any government, in my opinion, that brings that agreement. I mean, the settlers will make a lot of noise. There won't be, there'll be problems. But people want to be finished with the conflict. And I think the same is true of the Palestinians. I think, I may be wrong, I think that if Palestinians believe that the occupation is going to end and there's going to be an independent Palestinian state, nothing Hamas can do against it and it won't try to do against it. Because Hamas wants to be also supported. And they, they will not and cannot stop that if the Palestinians believe that the agreement really does mean end of occupation and independent Palestinian state. And that's the meaning of this 60, 70 percent on both sides. Both sides want to end the conflict, to end the occupation, depends on your point of view. We want peace, they want the end of occupation, whatever your reason. 
And uh, if that really were to happen, that is, in, in both cases you come with that agreement, it'll be supported. At the moment, nobody believes that it's possible, though. Israelis are convinced that the Palestinians will not accept any kind of compromise with Israel, and uh, Palestinians are convinced that Israel has no intention of leaving the territories. So. Great. Um, there are no more questions. We'll wrap it up. Um, and head it back up to um, 400 editors and pizza, maybe some continued questions and conversation. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.